For more physics related videos, please subscribe. Welcome to Stellar Physics 6D. In this video, I'm going to cover neutron stars. I've rated the physics level in this video as intermediate. Let's start off with a brief overview of the stellar life cycle so we can see where neutron stars come from. Stars are formed when a dust cloud collapses under gravity until its core gets hot enough to fuse hydrogen. At this point, the energy released by hydrogen fusion will support the star against gravity. This is called the main sequence phase of the star, and it is the majority of the star's life cycle. When the stellar core runs out of hydrogen, it will move on to the next stage of nuclear burning, which is helium fusion. This stage is called a red giant. After helium fusion, the next stage is carbon fusion, and then oxygen fusion, and if the star is sufficiently massive, this fusion process will continue, fusing heavier and heavier nuclei until you get an iron core. To fuse all the way to iron, the star needs to have a mass greater than about 10 solar masses. Once you have an iron core, further fusion requires energy to be put into the nuclei rather than releasing energy, and so there is nothing left to support the star against gravity, and it will collapse until it explodes in a core collapse supernova. This will leave behind a core remnant of either a black hole or a neutron star. If the star is below about 20 to 25 solar masses, you'll get a neutron star. Above that, you typically get a black hole. So broadly speaking, stars with mass between 10 to 20 or 25 solar masses will form a neutron star. So what is a neutron star exactly? Well, it's basically just a giant ball of neutrons. This ball has a diameter of about 20 kilometers and a mass of somewhere around one and a half solar masses. So this ball is extremely dense. It is so dense that the neutrons are basically all touching one another, so it's sitting somewhere around nuclear density. To give you an idea of how dense nuclear matter is, if you were to take one teaspoon of neutron star material and bring it to Earth, it would weigh as much as about 50 great walls of China. At the surface of the neutron star, gravitational forces are very strong. The metric deviation, which is this quantity 2gm over rc squared, where g is Newton's constant and c is the speed of light, is about one half. If this quantity were one, then you would have a black hole. So neutron stars are basically on the brink of becoming black holes. Now, you don't actually need to get to a metric deviation of one in order to get a black hole. It turns out that the star will collapse if the metric deviation reaches 8 ninths. I derive this in Stellar Physics 3D, where I covered the maximum neutron star mass and revisited it as well in Stellar Physics 4E. So if you want to see this derivation and understand exactly why the star is going to collapse if the metric deviation equals 8 ninths, I suggest you watch those videos. In this video, I'll just summarize that when the metric deviation equals 8 ninths, the central pressure required to hold the star up against gravity goes to infinity. And that's why it collapses, because you can't have infinite pressure. In fact, it'll probably collapse a little bit before 8 ninths. The maximum neutron star mass, which I'm not going to derive because I already covered it in Stellar Physics 3D and 4E, is not actually known, but it's expected to be somewhere between 2 and 3 solar masses. The reason we don't know the exact maximum neutron star mass is because we don't know what the equation of state of neutron star material is. This is one of the biggest unknowns in all of astrophysics. If you're finding this video interesting so far, I just ask that you please like and subscribe, and maybe share it with a few friends. Now even though we don't know the exact equation of state, we do have a rough idea of the type of material that a neutron star is made of. And basically we expect that they're made up of degenerate neutrons. If you don't know what degenerate matter is, I covered it in detail in Stellar Physics 4C, but essentially this is matter that has reached the limits of quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics says that you cannot confine a neutron to too small of a volume. And since neutron star material is extremely dense, we've essentially reached that quantum mechanical limit where neutrons cannot be crunched together any closer. This type of matter has very strange properties and can be summarized as the coldest type of matter you can have. To illustrate this, I'm going to draw two energy wells. The idea here is, the further up the well you are, the more energy you have. So, this well is normal matter that we experience every day on Earth. This is called a Maxwell-Boltzmann gas. It obeys things like the ideal gas law. And you can see that all of the matter is distributed well above this pink line, which is called the Fermi energy. 
For degenerate matter, all or most of the matter is distributed below the Fermi energy. This system has the lowest amount of energy possible. Now, some of the matter will have energies above the Fermi energy if the temperature is not zero. If the temperature is exactly zero, then the highest occupied energy state in the system will be the Fermi energy. That's how the Fermi energy is defined. It's the highest occupied energy state for a system at zero temperature. Now, degenerate matter need not have a zero temperature. It just has to have a temperature that's much less than the Fermi energy. So the temperature could be extremely high. It could even be something like a billion Kelvin. But if the Fermi energy for that system is much higher than that, it's essentially got the same properties as a zero temperature system. So collapsing stellar cores and neutron stars thermodynamically are the coldest objects in the universe. Now at this point, you might be wondering what's actually holding the neutron star up against gravity. And this comes back to this quantum mechanical limit that says you cannot push the neutrons any closer than they already are. When you reach that limit where the neutrons cannot be confined to a smaller space, this results in an extraordinarily large pressure called degeneracy pressure. And that's what supports the star against gravity. So we know this much about neutron star matter. As far as the details of the equation of state, this is still largely a mystery. But various models have been proposed. So here we have a plot of neutron star mass versus radius with various equations of state superimposed on it. Each squiggly line here is a different equation of state. These horizontal red, orange, and yellow lines are examples of known neutron stars. So whatever the equation of state you have, it's going to have to cross these lines because it has to fit the observed neutron stars. Now I want to turn your eye to these green lines. They're labeled SQM and then some number. So SQM stands for strange quark matter. In this model, the neutron star is not actually made up of neutrons. It's made up of what are called quarks. Neutrons and protons are composite particles. They're each made up of three different quarks. So in this SQM model, because the material is so dense and hence the energy is so high, the quarks inside the neutrons have disassociated. So instead of having this big ball made up of a sea of neutrons, it's made up of a sea of quarks. But you can see that these models don't really fit, particularly with neutron stars with mass of two solar masses or higher. And I should point out that since this paper has come out, there's been a few neutron stars with masses greater than two solar masses that have been discovered. Next thing I want you to take a look at is these gray and black regions. These are various physical limits to the neutron star mass radius relationship. This black one here, labeled GR for general relativity, is the limit where the metric deviation equals one. At that point, you have a black hole. It's no longer a neutron star. This one here, where we have P is less than infinity, that's the limit I talked about where the metric deviation has to be less than eight ninths. At eight ninths, P goes to infinity. This one here, this limit called causality, is where the speed of sound in the material equals the speed of light. So you can see that even though we have a limit at p goes to infinity, the neutron star will likely collapse before then because it will reach a point where the speed of sound equals the speed of light. Another thing I like to point out is that most of the models that are accepted are these dark blue lines here. And one thing that's very interesting here is that you can see that for most of this diagram, these lines are essentially vertical, meaning that for neutron stars, if you increase the mass, the radius doesn't change, which is a rather interesting property. Okay, so that's the basic overview of what a neutron star is. Now I'd like to talk about what are called pulsars. Pulsars are just spinning neutron stars. So if you have a neutron star and it's spinning about some axis, it turns out that neutron stars actually have very strong magnetic fields. And just like on Earth, the rotational axis and the axis of the magnetic field are not lined up perfectly. So you know that the physical North Pole of the Earth is not exactly in the same place as the magnetic North Pole, but they're close. Well, the same thing is true for neutron stars. Now, due to this very strong magnetic field, neutron stars emit high-energy radiation jets from their magnetic poles. And as the star spins, these jets spin around with it. 
And if you're located in the right place, let's say you're located over here, looking at the neutron star, as it spins around, this jet will sometimes be pointing at you and sometimes not. And so when you look at it, what you're going to see is a pulsating light. And hence, this is called a pulsar. Now, probably most, if not all, neutron stars are pulsars because most neutron stars are going to be spinning at least a little bit. But we can only call them pulsars if we can see this pulsating light. And that means we can only see them as pulsars if this light beam happens to be aimed at the Earth as it spins around. If it's not pointing at the Earth, then we won't see this pulsating light. Does this mean it's not a pulsar? No, but it means we can't call it a pulsar because we don't know if the reason we don't see this light beam is because it doesn't have one or because it just happens to not be pointing at us. Just as an interesting anecdote, the first pulsar ever discovered was called LGM, which stood for Little Green Men, because they didn't know what it was, and it was half-jokingly suggested that this pulse of light was actually aliens trying to communicate with us. Now, very soon after its discovery, more pulsars were discovered, so that immediately ruled out the possibility that this was an alien civilization trying to communicate with us. One very important thing about neutron stars is that they sometimes collide in what's called a neutron star merger, or a kilonova. Apart from being a spectacular collision, neutron star mergers are actually very important because it's thought, by many, that this is where our process nucleosynthesis in the universe takes place. Our process nucleosynthesis is one of the main mechanisms for making elements and nuclei beyond iron. I covered this in detail in Stellar Physics 5H. But essentially the way this process works is, you have a bunch of neutrons piling onto a large nucleus. That's what the R stands for. It stands for Rapid Neutron Capture. And what you need for the R process to take place is an environment where you have a large number of neutrons and a small number of seeds, so that each seed can capture a lot of neutrons. And that's pretty much exactly what you have in neutron stars. It's pretty much all neutrons with a handful of seed nuclei floating around. The other big candidate for our process nucleosynthesis is supernovae, which I covered in the previous video, Stellar Physics 6C. And if you watch that video, or if you watch Stellar Physics 5H, you'll know that the problem with our process taking place in supernovae is that, for one, the neutron to seed ratio is not super high. You do have a lot more neutrons around, but it's nothing like a neutron star. But the main problem is supernovae emit an enormous number of neutrinos, and the effect of that is that the neutrinos capture on the neutrons, which results in the neutrons being locked up into alpha particles, which are helium-4 nuclei. This is called the alpha effect, and the fact that you've locked up all your neutrons into alpha particles kills the R process. I covered this in detail in Stellar Physics 5H. And so making all of the R process material in supernovae doesn't really work. In the case of neutron star mergers, the alpha effect is not a problem. Not because there's no neutrinos. In fact, when the neutron stars collide, they do emit an enormous amount of neutrinos. But there's so many neutrons around initially that the alpha effect doesn't actually prevent you from making all of the R process material. Furthermore, if you notice in this artistic representation here, there are these tails coming off of the neutron stars. And these tails come from the fact that as the neutron stars spin in together, the tidal forces are so strong that it rips material off of the neutron star. The neutrinos are only emitted once the neutron stars collide. So all of this matter that's ripped off in these tidal tails will undergo our process nucleosynthesis, and there's no neutrinos around to lock your neutrons into alphas. So neutron star mergers are a great candidate for our process nucleosynthesis. But this theory does have its problems. For one, we don't know how much material is actually ejected. When these two neutron stars collide, they'll probably end up forming a black hole. And so the question becomes, out of the matter that's ejected, how much actually escapes and how much falls back into the black hole? Because if you make a bunch of R process material and it just falls back into the black hole, well, that can't explain the R process material we see in the universe. The other major problem is how often do neutron star mergers actually take place? Do they happen often enough to explain the amount of R process material we see in the universe? Supernovae are actually quite common. They happen all the time. But neutron star mergers 
as far as we know, are not actually that common. You can imagine you've got these two balls that are only 20 kilometers wide, and given the enormous size of the universe, they have to bump into each other. That doesn't seem very likely. One theory is that these mergers tend to take place in what are called globular clusters. A globular cluster is a very large cluster of stars that are all gravitationally bound together. And when you have matter bound together by gravity, denser material falls towards the center. And neutron stars, being extremely dense, will tend to fall towards the center of the globular cluster. And so some people have suggested that globular clusters are in some sense neutron star merger factories. So we have these two competing theories as to where our process material comes from, supernovae or neutron star mergers. Chances are it's a little bit of both. But the question is, which one is the dominant mechanism? Regarding neutron star mergers, we're actually going to be able to answer this question in the near future via the detection of gravitational waves. When neutron stars spiral into one another, their gravitational fields spiral around with them, and this emits gravitational waves, which we can now detect. Now, how do you detect a gravitational wave? In general relativity, gravity is caused by the curvature of space-time. So as this wave goes by, space and time are stretched, but not in a uniform fashion. So parallel to the propagation of the wave, space-time will be stretched differently than perpendicular to the propagation of the wave. And by measuring this difference in stretching, we can detect gravitational waves. So here we have the LIGO detector, which is where gravitational waves were first detected. It has these two arms that are perpendicular to one another. And the way it works is you send a laser down this arm and then it reflects and comes back. And you do the same thing down this one. And you send your lasers such that they come back out of phase. So you can think of light as a wave. It's got peaks and troughs. You set up your lasers such that for one arm, it comes back at a peak, and for the other one, it comes back at a trough. When they meet together, the peak and the trough cancel out, and so your detector doesn't detect any light. However, if a gravitational wave passes by, space-time will be stretched across this leg differently than across this one. And so now, these two lasers will no longer arrive at your detector perfectly out of phase, and it will detect light. And that's how you can detect gravitational wave going by. So now that we can detect gravitational waves, we can detect neutron star mergers. And the information we get from the gravitational waves, coupled with the information we get from the light being emitted from the neutron star merger, will give us information about the equation of state of the matter in neutron stars, as well as how much our process material was actually created. So in the next few decades, we expect to learn a lot more about neutron stars. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to like and subscribe, and hit the bell to be notified for future videos. In the next video, I'm going to cover black holes. This will be the final video of this series on stellar physics. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.